Welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. We are here today for our virtual field trip. And it's truly going to be a virtual one at that. I'm going to give time for people to come on board. I want to say hello, Destin Affair. Destin's Affair. Petra Brennan, welcome, welcome. You've been a hard person to keep in contact with during this COVID season. Welcome, Alicia. I'm going to wave to a couple of people here. And I'm having trouble with my life. All right, Raymond, welcome, welcome, welcome. Somebody from staff, please uh, put the uh, information in the box so I can pin it, if you don't mind. Uh, if you can put the information so I can pin it. KPZ, Ms. Brandon, welcome. Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome. Please tell a friend and my light keep packing up. Tell a friend and tell a friend. We're getting ready to get started here. Hey Raymond, good to see you, sir. Always great to see you in the place, Javo. Please tell a friend and tell a friend. We're going to get started with this week's tour. I'm going to go and do some send outs. See if we can get a couple more people on here that is uh maybe having lunch or waiting for this episode of virtual tours no everyone is now coming back out of it i see the beaches are open here in miami and everybody flocked to the beach staff please uh if someone can pin again pin the information in the bottom or make the comment and i will tag it Oh, interesting, I just found out that when you press the send, it notifies you in Facebook. That was the noise that we just heard, notification of Facebook. Sending out a send to our good old friends at the Southeast Overtown Park West Community Redevelopment Agency, just going through and sending out, letting everybody know we're having a virtual tour today. Should be an exciting opportunity a great discussion we look forward to many of you coming on board and asking questions i'm almost done with my sins oh boy this is amazing going down this line and letting everybody know we're going to get started very soon I think I did it. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, again, if someone can. <laughs> Mr. Brandon said he's standing in this pool. Uh, here we go. Thank you, KPZ. I see it here. I'm gonna see if I can pin it. Uh, yeah, there we go. Anybody on Facebook? I don't know if any of my staff is on Facebook. If you'll make the comment so that we could we can pin it as well. So yeah, definitely, if you have a, a pool, stay home in the pool. Yeah. Anybody on Facebook that's with us, please give us a shout out so we'll know that you're here. I just went through waving at several people. Saying hello, hello to everyone, I'm waving. See our board chair is on as always. Thank you so much for the support and what we're doing here. Anybody's on Facebook that's here, definitely. Definitely. Okay. All right. We're going to get started. Don't want to hold you long. I certainly appreciate everyone that has uh, come on board. Thank you so much. Whoever just posted this in our path was able to, did I pin it? I think I pinned it. Yes, I pinned it. Okay, great. So appreciate everyone that is on, everybody that's here for this virtual tour. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Uh, that we're going to get started. Um, I have a great virtual tour planned uh, for us. 
I hope that you can see the screen behind me and it's, it's uh, viewable um, as we get started to do this tour. We're going to take a trip uh, to uh, a few. Uh, hello, Jocelyn. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being on. We're going to take a trip to a few of our landmarks that we have here in Miami and talk a little bit more candidly about it. Uh, I, I, I encourage you to share your memories of these landmarks or if you have any other information or any questions, uh, please feel free to do it in the comments. Uh, so that we can um, acknowledge uh, your question and get your question answered. Uh, if there's more information that we don't have, we would address and send you to the place uh, that has that particular information. So uh, if we're ready to take our trip, I ask you to put on your VR goggles if you have them as we take this trip uh, on our virtual uh, tour. I'm going to, something's bugging me, and I think it's this light here. That's in my screen. I'm going to just move it out. Just got some new studio lights and we just uh, decided about having them. They, they works out, work real well. Uh, but the thing picked up. Uh, oh, well. Okay, we'll figure it out, um, you know, as we go through to keep the lights from off the screen so that you can see the screen. Uh, so here we go. We're going to take our first trip. Uh, to a location in, in, that is in historic Overtown. Uh, this trip goes to a location known as the JNS Building, uh, which many people know as the Cola Nip. Uh, was located at 227 Northwest 9th Street. And again, I say it was located at 227 Northwest 9th Street because it no longer is there as many of the historic monuments that were in Overtown. Uh, so the overhead screen, uh, puts the JNS building. Does this work? I don't think the pointer is going to work for us on the TV screen. Uh, but it puts the uh, 227 like right about here in its proximity. Uh, if you're familiar with Overtown, and I'm looking at this in reverse, uh, you have Greater Bethel, which is here. Uh, you have the Historic Lyric Theater, which is here. Uh, you have uh, 8th Street, 7th Street here. 8th Street is here. And right along Second Avenue, you make that right turn, you'll be right there at where the Cola Nip, Cola Nip Bottling Company uh, used to sit, also known as the JNS Building. This is a street uh, view of the way it looks now. Uh, well, it has changed since this Google shot. Uh, now it's a parking lot for the Red Rooster. Uh, but the Cola Nip Bottling Company was an amazing manufacturing company, as you can see. Uh, some of the architecture and even really close, uh, you can see right here. Uh, does my, my fine glass work? Oh, let's see, let's see, I think, let's see if this, okay, yeah, yeah, it allows us to zoom in. Great, awesome, learning technology. So if you see the JNS, that's, that is signature amongst many buildings uh, that you have, um, that it will have the name of the building. So you see JNS 19, um, it was 19, built in 1930, I believe it was. Uh, but definitely the JNS building is there. Uh, here you have the, the JNS building in a article, the Cola Nip, the Cola Nip Bottling Company that talked about the bottling company. This bottling company uh, was um, established by a man by the name of Osborne Jenkins and William Sampson. Osborne Jenkins and William Sampson. If you can hear me, if I'm coming through clear, let me know. I see some, uh, so it looks like 25. Okay. Yes, definitely. It looks like 25. It's in my notes here. Um, Osborne Jenkins and uh, William Sampson uh, started this co this uh, cola bottling company uh, that sat on 227 9th Street. But now initially, uh, the cola nip bottling, their motto, as you can see here, did that come out? Oh, wow. We have a slide backwards. Let's see if I could uh, go back and reverse that because I want you to see this. I'm going to come out of this just briefly and I want to fix that one slide that doesn't have it reversed for you. Um, how did I get that get past me? I'm not sure. Just give me one second to bring that up so you can see this ad in its entirety. Okay, I think we got it. I do apologize for that because in order for you to be able to see it, I have to do the slideshow from the current slide. Boom, here we go. So um, 
Osborne and William, uh, they were uh, two African-American businessmen uh, in 1920. In 1920, now the uh, the original location of the Colonel Bottling, Bottling Company was 926 uh, Northwest Third Avenue. 926 Northwest Third Avenue, uh, and they moved. They moved actually. Thank you, Miss Brainer, when she said that because uh, it's 1925. They moved uh, to the new building in 1925. Uh, the Osborne, which is the 227 uh, on this particular ad is 221. As we know, um, addresses changed as buildings went up. Uh, but this building, 227, uh, was located in Colortown. Uh, the company bottled carbonated beverages uh, such as Cola Nip, Orange Smile, and Peach Whip. Uh, the manufacturing was limited to only the production of bottling and the distribution of soda water. So this was the Cola Nip. Uh, interesting enough, by 1929, the Cola Nip was one of 13 bottling companies in Miami, one of 13. And this one was owned by uh, a black man, two black men who started this particular business. Um, during that same year, Osborne Jenkins died. He, he died um, tragically. His wife, uh, Carrie, she became the uh, co-owner uh, of the company and together with W.E. Sampson, uh, what uh, Kerry, they were able to do, they managed the company until 1937. Uh, now, when Jenkins' new husband, Ray Johnson, came along, he assumed his wife's responsibilities at the Colonel Bottling Company. Uh, and uh, the company sadly went out of business around 1940. The Colonel Bottling Company went out of business in 1940. I do want to uh, show you or kind of if I can highlight this real quick, uh, this sign here. Uh, and I'm giving you some little insight and some little tidbits of, of information that I'm aware of. Uh, this sign was from the Atlanta, Atlanta Life Insurance Company who was housed in the JNS building over a period of time. Sadly, uh, this sign still existed. Um, we still, when I came to the Black Archives as an intern in 2003, uh, I saw this physical sign. It was, it used to be stored up, up under the Orange Bowl, the original Orange Bowl, the old Orange Bowl. So the, the Atlantic Life sign was at the Orange Bowl, as well as parts, significant architectural parts of this building, like the parapets and the monuments that you see along the roof area. Uh, all of these parts to this building uh, existed at the original Orange Bowl site, and, and I call it the, the alcoves, the under under the Orange Bowl, the part that many people don't see. Uh, and um, sadly enough, when they went to knock down the Orange Bowl, because they were supposed to use some of these parts to rebuild this, because this building is on the National Register, uh, those, those parts disappeared. The, everything that went down with the Orange Bowl, it must have still been under there when they demolished the Orange Bowl, uh, we lost those parts. I'm looking at Miss Brandon saying one of my aunts worked there at the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Awesome, awesome. Interesting enough, uh, yes, uh, this was a major company, a uh, major business in Overtown. This is actually, uh, in subsequent years, the building housed such business as the Wisteria Hotel and the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. The picture that you're looking at is a group of employees at the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. This is a group of employees that are standing in front of the JNS building at the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. I'm just going to zoom in here. You'll see some of the signage there, right there behind it. Uh, the Atlanta Life Insurance Company, just to show you what it is. Now, um, in later years, in later years, uh, the structure became known as the JNS. Now, the Cola Nip Bottling Company is considered to be an example of masonry vernacular. Uh, is the architecture of it uh, is something that was significant in Miami-Dade County. Uh, it was considered to be uh, one of the more interesting structures in Overtown, um, known for its detail and um, its applied ornamentation, as you can see along the top. It was very prominent, the, the, the structure uh, itself was very, very prominent. Okay, Marcus Paramore, hello on Facebook, Marcus. He said that his aunt worked at Atlanta Life Insurance Company too. That's awesome news. Uh, Marcus Paranoia has said his aunt's name was Mildred Wade that worked at the Atlanta Life, Life Insurance Company at the JNS building. Uh, so the Colonel 
building it it was uh, an example it exemplified vibrancy it exemplified life in the heyday of what was then known as colored town this was the only manufacturing company in the community um and is a representative representative of black success uh doing segregation it was a representative of black success uh doing jim crow uh the business operated and, and survived in this community doing segregation and that was very important but sadly sadly as we have seen with many of our structures uh the landmark ended in, in near its final days sadly it neared its final days and while they were saving structures on south beach they were saving historic structures in the white part of miami in the black part of miami the whole focus was the knockdown 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 new 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 uh i remember uh hearing dr phil talk about when she tried to save many of the buildings uh many of the architecture and the city's engineers and said hey uh that building can't be saved because it was built with sea salt water and uh last time we checked that was the same water that they were using on miami beach to build all of those structures that they saved uh so that's the aspect of the disparity between uh how whites view their architecture and their history as well as the less lack of respect for the black history and even from some black people uh in miami uh the lack of respect for what we have i mean you know if you don't know where you come from you never know when they're trying to take you back uh, that mentality of preserving, preserving, preserving what we own is a lesson for the future. So let me get off my soapbox there and we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Uh, if anybody have any questions about the JNS, please put them in the comments uh, as we continue to move on. We're going to go to our next site, our next site for today in our virtual tour. Uh, we're going to head over to what was known as the Booker Terrace Motel, the Booker Terrace Motel at 4200 Northwest 27th Avenue, the Booker Terrace Motel. Some people are probably like, what is the Booker Terrace Motel? Well, the Booker Terrace Motel was known as Brownsville uh, Million Dollar uh, Hotel. It's a million dollar, Brownsville Million Dollar Hotel. And this is the way that the, the site looks now, uh, today. Uh, and then just a little bit on brownsville's million dollar hotel that was known as the book of terrace motel uh, it was uh it was the developers george tanneloff a miami beach attorney and david berwick who was a former philadelphia manufacturer uh they announced plans that they were going to develop a 50 room main motel building uh and a 12 apartment motel building and a two combination of apartment motel store uh yeah, buildings on uh 27th avenue that was their whole purpose to do this now they wanted this hotel to cater to the high class professional people entertainers and other substantial negroes that would be visiting miami that that was our quote this was a quote i'm sorry uh that they wanted to cater to high class professional people uh entertainers and other substantial negroes visiting uh miami uh now so as Book of Terrace began to grow, it officially opened in July of uh, 1954, July of 1954. Uh, promotional packages for the Book of Terrace uh, Hotel advertised special rates for couples, uh, advertised uh, air conditioned rooms, a swimming pool, dining room, cocktail lounge, and luxury at a low cost. Uh, this is what they dictate now. The motel quickly, the motel quickly became very popular uh, and leading uh, the black social center of Miami. It became very popular and leading in the black social uh, center in Miami. As you can see in this particular picture, uh, some of you may know uh, who this gentleman is. Uh, some may not know who that is. Anybody can see who that is? Is it visible so somebody can make out who this particular person is right here in the middle? right there anybody can make out who that person is okay well uh that person right there as book of terrors became more and more all right marcus paramore marcus paramore kp you can't answer the questions you work for the black archives that is sammy davis jr indeed so book of terrors became quickly popular now after a default in the lease, after there was a default 
in the lease. Uh, Harry and Florence Markowitz, they were the owners of the Book of Terrace. They received the property from the investors. There, were, there was a default in the lease and Harry and Florence Markowitz, they took ownership of the property from the investors. There's nothing new under the sun. And they renamed it. In 1961, the Markowitz family, they sponsored a contest to rename uh, the motel and the apartments. They, took a con they, they did a contest. They wanted to rename the hotel. And it was a woman by the name of Mrs. Vernica uh, Silva. Vernica Silva. She was a Coconut Grove school teacher. Uh, she came up with the winning name and she named it the Hampton House. Her winning name was to rename the Book of Terrors Motel from the Book of Terrors to calling it the Hampton House. Uh, I don't know if anybody's online. I know this isn't virtually uh, Jeopardy nor, but anybody can tell me the significance between Vernica Silver seeing the name of it being the Book of Terrors Motel, which we know was named after somebody prominent in the black community, um, to now it's being called the Hampton House. Can anybody connect that significance for me? Anybody, Vernica uh, Silva, anybody can connect that, um, that connection between the Book of Terrace Motel and Vernica Silva naming it the Hampton House. Come on, Oscar JB, <laughs> you are Jeopardy Nor uh, expert. Anybody can connect why Vernica Silva possibly took the name, the Hampton House, the Hampton House. Okay, it's very tight. Ah, there you go. Thank you, Oscar JB1. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't let me down, Oscar JB1. Yes, Hampton Institute was Booker, uh, Booker T. Washington's first school, Hampton Institute. So, after being named the Book of Terrors, it was Vernica, Vernica Silva that decided the connection should be called Hampton House. So it was, uh, it was uh, directly connected, and that would just shows you her br brilliance uh, and being able to do that to keep the context of uh, the naming of the hotel uh, strong. So among uh, the notable and historic events uh, were repeated visits to the Hampton House uh, by, by, by different notaries, uh, people of significant stature. Uh, there was this famous press conference that was held by uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is told that he had read a, a, a portion of his I Have a Dream speech at this particular press conference before doing it on the March of Washington. Uh, as well as, of course, uh, Malcolm X, Cassius Clay, who was then known as, uh, well, Muhammad Ali was today, but he was known as Cassius Clay. They celebrated his victory over Sonny Liston uh, there uh, at the Hampton House on February 25th, 1964. Now, Ali routinely, Ali routinely stopped uh, by the Hampton House Motel during his many visits to Miami. Ali also owned a house that was uh, right around uh, the corner from the Hampton House for 46. And uh, significantly in this particular picture, we, we see uh, Muhammad Ali, but anybody can tell me who is this gentleman right there next to Muhammad Ali? Anybody can tell me who is this gentleman? <laughs> Oscar Bray say he like to sleep late. I'm sorry, uh, Facebook. Uh, they got something going on, on the Instagram where Oscar Brain and, uh, is answering all the questions. So uh, Camila Pritchard offered him a job. And Mr. Brain said he like to sleep late. <laughs> so um, anybody can tell me who this particular individual is seated next to Cassius Clay, then Cassius Clay. Anyone? Give you a little time. Do, 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 just so who you know. Um, anybody, anybody can tell me who that particular gentleman gentleman is sitting right next to Cassius Clay at the Hampton House. No, not Jim Brown. Are you doing that on purpose? Uh Oscar JV1, are you doing that on purpose? Uh it's not JV. I'm gonna we're gonna move on. Uh that person that is seated right next to Cassius Clay is the former, yes indeed, Joe Lewis, the former heavyweight champion, Joe Lewis, right with there with uh, Cassius, Cassius Clay. So, uh, you know, I always like to point out if you guys watch the version of um, Ali that Will Smith played in, at the beginning of that particular movie, 
uh, you'll see Will Smith start out running. And what Will Smith would do is he would uh, he would run to uh, he in the video in the movie. If you watch the movie again, he ran into a cafe, ordered a glass of orange juice, and kept running. Uh, and and that was a representation of what Muhammad Ali used to do here in Miami. He would leave his home at times before he bought his home. He stayed in apartments behind uh, the Hampton House, uh, part of Booker Terrace Motel. But he would leave his house run to the cafe there at uh, the Hampton House, get a drink, and then continue on his run all the way to the Fifth Street Gym on Miami Beach. So if you watch that movie, check that out. That's what they were uh, implying in the beginning of the movie. Now, uh, the, today the historic Hampton House Community Trust has completely restored this beautiful venue and they converted the building into a business and culture center as well as museum. Uh, they're hosting a lot of jazz sessions here. Uh, interesting, you see the reflecting pool behind me. Uh, they decided not to build the pool uh, because, of course, the permits that come with redoing the pool. So they decided to do a, 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 a reflective pool uh, to pay to commemorate the pool that existed there. Uh, they used to do many things there at that particular pool. Um, we're excited about the Hampton House. This is a, a current picture of the inside of the Hampton House. If you have not been to visit the Hampton House, as soon as they lift uh, the COVID-19, uh, the, the social distancing, as soon as the Hampton House come online, this is a great place for you to visit and support and patronize. So as we continue to move on in our virtual tours, uh, we have the Mary Elizabeth Hotel. We're coming back to the Mecca, uh, which is Miami. 642 Northwest 2nd Avenue would have been right here in this space right here. Um, this is the post office, which is here. Uh, the Lyric Theater is north of there. And uh, Longshoreman uh, just pointed out Bethel to give you an idea of where the Mary Elizabeth used to sit. 642 Northwest 2nd Avenue. This is what you see today. Uh, if you need to Take a picture, please take a picture because this view is going to change as I believe there's a developer setting to build a big box unit there uh, that would include uh, a Target as well as a Best Buy uh, and some other amenities uh, that's going to be into this particular development. It is changing. Um, the Creighton's Creighton, Secret Sauce. I am so going, I can't believe they didn't take us to these places for the field trip when I was in school. It would have been amazing and eye-opening. I don't know when you were in school, um, uh, Secret Sauce, but uh, this particular, the Hampton House just uh, was restored possibly in the last two years. Prior to that, it had uh, been closed for many years. Uh, maybe three years possibly has been reopened, but definitely uh, please, if you have opportunity to go by. But this is the Mary Elizabeth location where it used to sit. This place is going to change rapidly uh, as much. Uh, so if you can go by, this is that open space is no longer going to be there. I uh, want to point out, did I lose my, okay, there we go. want to point out um, this ad. If you can make this ad out, it's the Mary Elizabeth Hotel and Restaurant. This is from uh, an article. Pat Brain said 2016 is when they reopened it. Yes, thank you. About four years ago. Uh, so this particular ad advertised the Mary Elizabeth Hotel as an entertainment nightly cocktail lounge, banquet rooms, uh, ballroom, convention hall, uh, reasonable rates. Uh, this was the advertisement of the uh, Mary Elizabeth. Now, let me share just a little uh, something for you. Uh, the Mary Elizabeth Hotel uh, was the one of the first, if not the first hotel in Miami uh, to have an elevator. It was considered a skyscraper uh, at the time. The Mary Elizabeth was considered a skyscraper owned by a black man. Uh, the Mary Elizabeth uh, was exactly four stories high. Four stories high. Uh, the hotel was operated. I'm sorry, I need to back up just a moment uh, just to give you some tidbit, just a little bit. The Mary Elizabeth was built in 1921, 1921 uh, by Dr. William B. Sawyer. Uh, Dr. Sawyer uh, operated the hotel, the Mary Elizabeth, which you see there, operated this particular hotel um, with his wife, Alberta Sawyer. Uh, she was a businesswoman, and this was a businesswoman at a time 
uh, where such vocations for women were exceptional. You know, um, you know, it's, uh, it was just uh, this amazing phenomenon that oh, you know, women didn't have the business sense, but yes, women did always have uh, business savvy. Uh, and Sawyer uh, made sure that his wife was a part of this, uh, this uh, managing of this hotel. Now the hotel was named after their first child. Their first child, Mary Elizabeth. Uh, the child died in infancy. Their child died in infancy, and they named it the Mary Elizabeth. Uh, here you see uh, one of my favorite pictures of the Mary Elizabeth Hotel because it just showcased the uh, the 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 uh, assistant archivist profile, Dr. Sawyer, on his legacy profiles. Great was a segment the other week. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, for joining us on our legacy profiles. This is one of my favorite photos of it because it just shows this Art Deco style of this hotel in Overtown where they said Art Deco was only uh, on the beach. But if you look at the way this hotel was built with the metal letters and, and the slim line, the over, overhangs over the windows, this was truly an Art Deco hotel, which was a a skyscraper back in 1921 and had a working elevator. Now, the Mary Elizabeth was the tallest building in Colortown at the time with 90 rooms. It was the tallest building in Colortown. It was located on the corner of Northwest 2nd Avenue and 7th Street and was considered a well-equipped edifice uh, with elevator service and intercommunication system that connected the rooms to the desk, the lobby desk. It connected the rooms uh, to the lobby desk. Uh, the hotel had private private bathroom facilities available for 37 of the rooms and the Mary Elizabeth served uh, as a favorite retreat for many, many dignitaries. This particular photograph here, I'm going to zoom in here uh, just very briefly right over here. And I want to see, can anybody tell me who this particular person possibly is inside of the Mary Elizabeth? Anybody can tell me who this person could be. Anybody, any guests, uh, anybody that wants to do Jeopardy Noir, uh, let me know. Anybody know who this person, right about here, who that person is? Uh, give you a couple of seconds to try to visualize and see who that in particular person could be. Anybody could guess, anybody that recognizes. All right, Ms. Brandon got the answer. Yes, that is Dr. Fields. That is Dr. Fields, the founder of the Black Archives, uh, at the, the Elizabeth, Mary Elizabeth hotel. She was having, uh, her party, her dinner party at the Mary Elizabeth hotel. Uh, amazing pictures. When I come across a lot of Dr. Phil's, uh, pictures when she was a little one. Um, so this was a major part. It was a uh, Dr. Phil's. Now, um, uh, many dignitaries visited the Mary Elizabeth. This is a picture here. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who was a mentor of Dr. Sawyer frequented the hotel on his way to and from conferences in the West Indies. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, her son, her son, Bert, managed the hotel uh, based drugstore. There was a drugstore inside the hotel, and Mary McLeod Bethune's son, Bert, uh, was the manager of that drugstore for many years. So it was uh, uh, never unordinary for anyone to greet Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune as she went to and fro inside of the store to see her son. Other dignitaries who stayed at this hotel included A. Philip Randolph, Thurgood Marshall, and Adam Clayton Powell, Manny. Uh, I want to point out here, just see if I can zoom in again, uh, the many, the many uh, um, conferences that were held at the Mary Elizabeth Hotel. This one is the headquarters of the National Insurance, National Negro Insurance Association. This was there, they had a conference uh, here. So it, it was many conferences here. Again, this is a very beautiful shot of the Mary Elizabeth. I'm just gonna point out some more architecture that you may be able to see from the clocks uh, to, to again, uh, we're looking at the uh, architect. Oh, back up, didn't wanna go there yet. Um, we're looking at a lot of the, the, the lettering, the channel lettering. You see the, the louvers, uh, window louvers. This is all concepts of Art Deco architecture uh, that should have been uh, kept and preserved. Uh, so also want to point out on July 23rd, uh, this is what we call um, the postcards. Many hotels back in the heyday had these crayon-like um, uh, iconic 
uh, postcards. Mary Elizabeth had one as well, uh, a postcard that uh, it had on July 23rd, the Mary Elizabeth Hotel hosted the Miss Latin America beauty pageant and representatives of many Latin American countries, as well as numerous guests from the United States attended the beauty contest where Monica Major of Puerto Rico was crowned Miss Latin America. Now, why is this so important that, that, that the Mary Elizabeth hosted the Miss uh, um, the Latin America beauty pageant? Well, understand this. Uh, and people fail to realize when we see what is happening today uh, with the protest that is happening. And when you look out and you watch the protests and for George Floyd, you're seeing people of color. You're seeing black people. You're seeing white people. You're seeing Hispanic people. Uh, you're, you're seeing Latin people. You're seeing uh, Mexican people. You're seeing all of these people coming together uh, to protest. Well, a time there was a time in uh, United States history well, where, where we already know the one third drop rule, but beyond that, if your skin wasn't a certain hue, brown people too, yes, indeed. Uh, if your skin wasn't a certain hue of white, you were considered black and you were not allowed to stay in white hotels. You were not allowed to stay in white hotels. This was a, a tragic occurrence of American history. And this is why so many people are upset uh, because it didn't matter whether you were black by descent, African descent, if your skin was brown, if your skin was beige, if your skin was not the white hue, they did not allow you to live there. Uh, so the Latin America, of course, we know that many of our ancestors were left in our Caribbean countries. Uh, many of our ancestors were less left in South America. Well, we already know more Africans went to South America, Brazil, than America. So when you talk about the Latin Miss America beauty pageant, of course, there were going to be some beautiful, beautiful Latin dark skinned uh, uh, women a part of that and people associated with that color. So they were not allowed to have this pageant in downtown Miami, which was the white part of town. Prentice Cove, thank you for joining us. We are all connected back to Africa. Indeed, indeed, definitely. We're all brothers and sisters, definitely. So as well as stories about, um, and Pat Brain says some has have forgotten. Uh, but, but also I want to point out uh, that the Cuban national baseball team, the Cuban national baseball team was not allowed to stay in white Miami uh, because many of the players on a baseball team also had dark hued skin. Uh, so the Mary Elizabeth played a vital and very important role to uh, even Overtown itself uh, as a welcoming place for people of all walks of life. Uh, people of all walks of life were allowed to be in Overtown. So I want to segue a little bit to talk about uh, the Mary Elizabeth and what made Mary Elizabeth so famous. The Mary Elizabeth was a integral hub uh, of Color Town's festive nightlife. Uh, the reason so many uh, renowned African Americans lodged in Color Town uh, with such frequency was because of uh, uh, the issue of race in Miami or in America. They would perform in the great hotels on Miami Beach, but yet they were not allowed to live or to seek uh, a room at these particular hotels. One of the favorite movies that I like to watch that really depicted and caught uh, what were the issue of race in Miami at the time was a movie called, by, uh, called uh, On the Life of Dorothy Dandridge. Uh, Halle Berry played Dorothy, played Dorothy Dandridge. And the significant thing about the movie that I liked was that the first time she played at the Ritz uh, Carlton, I believe it was, uh, she asked for a dressing room. She asked just simple as something simple as a dressing room so I can get dressed. Uh, and the white people looked at her like she was crazy. And he said, okay, I got something for you. And what he did was gave her a broom closet, a broom closet. She's going to perform in front of these white audience and all she could be given was a bloom closet broom closet then she said well what about a room that she can sleep in they told her after she performed you need to get across the tracks because that's where your hotel is at they were making reference to color town at the time the interesting thing about the Dorothy Dangerous movie is that when the second time she came to Miami and performed at the same hotel in the scene, what they did was they opened the doors. They say, here, Dr. Dandridge, this is where you're set up at. And when she opened the double doors, it was this huge suite 
uh, inside the same hotel that she was going to perform in. So that signified the 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 uh, passing of the Civil Rights Act and, and integration, where they then opened up their doors to give her a suite at the hotel that she was going to perform in. That's good and bad. Good as now we are able to get what we are due. Bad because no longer did Dr. Dandridge uh, have to come over to Overtown to get a, a hotel, which when that stopped happening, people stopped coming to Overtown. Of course, that began to take the dollars out of the area. Now, why do I have this image behind me? Well, uh, when they performed in Miami, they could not stay in the hotels because of segregation. Uh, and, and Mary Elizabeth's other note to, to fame was a Paul Silverthorne. It came by way of Paul Silverthorne. Silverthorne was a successful artist, mural painter, interior decorator, and a designer uh, from the Art Deco period of Miami Beach. Uh, he was born in Toronto, Ontario uh, in 1914, and he entered art school in 1930. Uh, Silverthorne shared his classroom uh, with other noted artists of the day, including renowned artist uh, uh, Jean-Philippe Dyer. Uh, he left Toronto in the spring of 1939 uh, to visit relatives in New York, and he began to take up work in New York. Now, later, Silverthorne had wanted to go to Miami. He wanted to be a part of this tropical climate. He heard about many things that was happening there. So Silverthorne later hitchhiked, hitchhiked to Miami Beach and began to work uh, with leading architects of the time in Miami, including, including Igor Polovetsky and Trip Russell. Now, between November of 1939 and August of 1941, Silverthorne worked on such projects as the Sunny Isles Casino, uh, the Clover Club, the El Chico Club, the Club Bali, uh, the Fu Manchu Restaurant, and the famous Latin Quarter Nightclub. Now, following uh, the end of World War II, Paul Silverthorne continued his artistic endeavors uh, on Miami Beach by redecorating the Latin Quarter and the Vagabond Room at the Clover Club, uh, which was a gambling casino in Miami Beach. Now, uh, the next year, uh, Silverthorne created a unique nightclub in the Mary Elizabeth in Overtown uh, for William Sa Sawyer. He was hired by William Sawyer. Uh, this room was called the Zebra Room. It was called the Zebra Room uh, Lounge. And it, it, it was styled with this uh, black and white color uh, combination that began to be copied all across the United States. When people talk about the Zebra Room, they're talking about the Zebra Room, uh, the Mary Elizabeth Zebra Room, uh, which was copied across the United States with this theme. Here's some more images of the Zebra Room inside of the uh, Mary Elizabeth. Many of the famous black entertainers of the time played at the Mary Elizabeth, uh, including Count Basie, Cab Calloway, Dorothy Dandridge, and Lena Horne. Um, also, racial segregation uh, forced all people of color, regardless of their status, to seek lodging in African-American sections of cities and towns across the United States. Now, in Miami, after the last set, like I said, uh, many of the artists had, black entertainers had to journey across the railroad tracks of color town uh, to the hotels and the nightclubs. Often when they would come to Overtown, come to these hotels and nightclubs, they would have jam sessions all night long. While over in, in, in on Miami Beach, you played to see Count Basie and you paid to see Lena Horn in separate venues, a lot of times these, un, uh, these entertainers would converge onto the same stage and perform together. And they were wow the audiences in Overtown with some real, real, real music. Now, the Mary Elizabeth boasted two nationally famous lounges, the Zebra Room, which we mentioned, as well as uh, the Flamingo Room, which you see behind me. Uh, these were among the favorite venues for artists here in Miami. Now, as we've stated in Miami, what has happened over the years, the Jazzy Overtown Hotel uh, had to be torn down. Uh, June 15, 1983, shortly after the Neville Johnson riots that happened in December of 1990, uh, 19, excuse me, 82, December 1982, uh, many of the, 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 the structures were damaged. Uh, many of the neglected structures uh, were being knocked down 
as well as what's significant about 1983 and 1982, it was the start of the, the, the CRA, the Miami CRA, uh, where the whole purpose was to get rid of slum and blight. So this was an opportunity to knock down the remaining buildings of history. Uh, not saying the CRA was, was spearheaded this, but the language in the uh, law gave them the right to begin to knock down blighted buildings as opposed to uh, restoring the buildings like they did on the white part of Miami. Uh, CRA was started in 1982. The land was always wanted uh, and that led to the destruction of beautiful monuments in black Miami, like the Mary Elizabeth Hotel, uh, like the Sir John Hotel, uh, like the JNS building. And it, we're just thankful uh, that people like uh, Dr. Dorothy Jenkins Fields, uh, as, as well as Enid Pinkney, and the, all the people that went behind helping uh, these uh, giants uh, in preservation uh, save these buildings because so, I'm quite sure many of them wouldn't say, would, uh, would say that it isn't just them. Uh, you know, Wilhelmina Jennings, uh, who's uh, the mother of our, our, our chair, uh, was on the board of the Black Archives. You know, um, Athlete Range, late Athlete Range, uh, Leomi Comer. Uh, uh, we can go, the list goes on and on. I don't want to begin to start naming so many people uh, because I'm going to forget somebody, but. Uh, so many people went to trying to preserve a lot of the history, a lot of the history that they uh, grew up knowing about. And that's why a lot of times we're constantly walking backwards because we're, we're forgetting. We're having short-term memory uh, about the history that we have so much uh, created here in America that uh, we tend to, after a while, after the television crews leave, after news stations stop reporting on things, we a lot of times, uh, we a lot of times um, uh, forget. And Pat Brainer said they protested. Yes, yes, they protested. I, I, I've been, you could tell us more about that as well. We need to have a talk about what our ancestors, what our, our pioneers did to save a lot of the structures. And truthfully enough, a lot of times, it's our politicians that we have in those seats uh, that are not strong enough or, or do, don't care enough uh, to hear their constituents talk. You know, uh, we deal with that even today where, where politicians are not really coming behind and supporting, especially our black politicians, not coming behind and really supporting the issues of the black community. Uh, it tends a lot of times get to uh, be about them and not about uh, the people. Uh, and funny, I was having a conversation, I was segueing to this, having a conversation and somebody said that black politicians forget that they work for us and we don't work for them. They're so busy wanting us to say honorable and wanting us to say uh, uh, chair and want us to say all of these different things to give them accolades. But truthfully enough, they work for us. So they should be respecting us. I got an email from one of our politicians that, uh, you know, I don't even want to go there. And I'm sitting up there like, wow, you know, the mindset that you don't want to save a historic structure, um, that you don't want to invest the money while in, 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 in other parts of town that don't look like us wholly, they're saving their structures. They're finding ways to make sure that their history lives on. So if you, if you cement the history, if you cement the buildings, you don't always have to go back and teach. People will learn, you know. But right now, when somebody don't see uh, uh, a image, they don't see uh, what existed in the past, they tend to think that it never existed. And you have people that will erase those things. So we're certainly thankful. I'm glad that you're here. And we're going to have a session again. We're still working to have a session that talks about uh, the effect, the effect uh, of, of, of Black um, history, the effect of learning and, and make sure you understand your history. Uh, we're going to have a Zoom session soon. We're going to be working on that. I don't know if anyone has any questions uh, for this particular virtual tours. Quite possibly our virtual tours are going to start to look like this uh, on many occasions as we uh, continue to go through because uh, I really want you to see the before and afters on a lot of our structures. And then you, I want you to see uh, structures that have been knocked down. Uh, I remember getting into an argument uh, with uh, one of the former directors, God bless his soul, of the CRA when they began to knock down 
uh, where the five policemen were sworn in at, you know, and, and I just couldn't understand how can you give millions of dollars to people that where the building is not there, but the building that exists, you can't even give 500,000. You can't even give 600,000. You can't even give, we did the Dorsey house with $150,000. We were able to do it. Uh, and I was determined to do it. The Black Archives Lyric Theater was done with not one penny over $10 million. But when you talk about other locations uh, like institutions, like uh, the Adrian R Center, when you talk about other locations like the Dorsey Library and other places that have uh, uh, been giving a, a, a un, uh, unrestricted amount of money to restore itself, uh, when we ask for pennies, we're getting slapped in the face. So thank you so much for your time. Hope you enjoy. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna call out the secret sauce, Marcus Paramore. That's on uh, on our Facebook. Pat Brainin, KPZ, Joyce Four Thousand. Thank you for joining us. Of course, Oscar JB One. Enjoy your time in the pool. Uh, Cordelia, Cordelia. Thank you for joining us, Granny Girl. I see you. Hope you're getting better. Prentice Crow. Thank you so much for coming in. If anybody else on Facebook uh, that 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 want to get a shout out, please let me know. Javo, I see you on here. Uh, D. James Roosevelt, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Kadel 10 joined us. Triple uh, 3P, appreciate you so much for coming in today. Uh, looking Politically Just TV, thank you. Official uh, D. Fry Funk Band, thank you. Jody Petra Brandon of uh, Greater Miami Convention of Visitor Bureau, Multicultural Department, thank you for joining us. Rico Miami, he's one part of our, uh, be on our, uh, Lyric Live tonight, uh, Living Room Edition. It's Lynn, thank you for joining us from Baltimore. Swamp Made, my daddy's a realtor. I'm just going down the line real quick. Blackfreedom.org. I do wanna say this to blackfreedom.org. Uh, if you're, next Friday, I need to plug this. Next Friday, we will be doing a joint effort for Juneteenth celebration. I've been fortunate to be a part of a, a, a multi-museum a program that's gonna take place on Juneteenth, on Friday, uh, Black, uh, we're gonna post the link, uh, but it's blackfreedom.org. Please join it. Uh, we, 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 a couple of museums from the Charles Wright Museum to the Midwest Museum, to, uh, several museums have gotten together to do a Juneteenth celebration virtually. Um, just again, I am humbled to be a part of that particular uh, org organization and be a part of such a great group of people. Uh, black and again, it's blackfreedom.org. Please uh, check it out. Be with us on next Friday. Explore Mitchellville. Explore Mitchellville. That's what it is. Explore Mitchellville. My good friend Ahmad, uh, Daniel Park, Chicago. Thank you for joining us, Lewis. Oh, we had a lot of people activism. I'm, I, I just can't keep naming everybody. I'm gonna before this time run out. Just want to say thank you to everybody. To you, 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 and you. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Join us tonight for Lyric Live. Uh, the Living Room Edition, Lyric Live, the Living Room Edition, hosted by Cello and our DJ H2. Uh, we, we were giving out $150. So if you know somebody with a talent that don't mind coming on to social media, it's Lyric Theater MIA. That's our Lyric Theater handle. It's not on our Balt South Florida handle. It's on Lyric Theater MIA. You know somebody that got a talent, they can use $150. Please tell them to join us at 8 p.m. tonight, Lyric Theater MIA, Living Room Edition. Thank you so much, and we'll be back with you very soon. Everybody, please stay safe. Goodbye.